tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Inhale. That's good. An exclusive look at a new tool to better protect wildfire fighters in BC. Like I've definitely noticed uh, at the end of the season, like my lungs are definitely not nearly as strong as the start. Plus. So we're really excited to have an entire counseling hub. We'll take you inside a new center for survivors of sexual violence in Vancouver and. When, when I'm running down the hallway and I saw, I looked back and she really, I'd only gotten 10 steps from her door and it was too late to go back. Anger and sadness two years after a deadly fire ripped through a Gastown hotel. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Dan Burrow. Thanks for joining us. We start tonight with an exclusive look for you on pioneering research into new wild firefighting safety equipment. We've known about the risks of breathing in wildfire smoke for years. Now the BC Wildfire Service and a team from UBC and the University of Alberta have created advanced respirators, a global first. Shelley Joyce takes us to Pemberton where they tested out that new gear. We're here at the BC Wildfire Service Pemberton Fire Zone office to see some groundbreaking research on respiratory health on BC wildfire fighters. For the first time ever, BC Wildfire Service fighters will be offered a selection of masks to protect them from toxins and smoke while on the job. Inhale. Shh. That's good. This is Kyler Golan's 12th season fighting wildfires in BC and his first wearing a mask. I mean, it feels good considering it. I mean, I can definitely see how it present challenges, obviously working on the side of a steep hill or obviously doing all of our hand work and kind of feels like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, comfy. Mm -hmm. Say we were to hike into the fire, we would probably take these off. But when we start like uh, hot spotting or cold trailing or anything that really entails hands-on movement, we'd probably throw this on just to everything we're kicking up as we work would be obviously filtered out with this. So anything to obviously improve our safety measures and make, make things safer for us. Yeah, go for it, you three. Yeah, how are you? Smoke and soot are everywhere during fire season. It surrounds them as they douse the flames, when they're back at camp eating, when they're sleeping in their tents. One of the major concerns is something called fine particulate matter, which are tiny little particles in the air. They're invisible to the naked eye. Um, and when somebody breathes those in, they settle kind of in the deepest areas of the lungs um, where gas exchange actually occurs. And so these particles can um, cause local damage to your lungs, leading to uh, lung disease and lung cancer. And they can actually get into your blood where they go to all sorts of organs in your bodies, including the kidney, liver, heart, uh, and brain been doing this for over 10 years now and it's just nice to see them taking the steps to you know I mean unfortunately it's taken a couple busy years to kind of get recognition of how serious the wildfires are becoming. Is it something that kind of has been eating at you while you're going out and doing this work that it could be having a negative impact on your health? It definitely sits in the back of the mind especially like I said doing this 10 years um, but uh, it's 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 it's, it's a job we love, but it's definitely taking the toll upon years of doing this. Like I've definitely noticed uh, at the end of the season, like my lungs are definitely not nearly as strong as the start. Push, 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 push. Big inhale. It's a reality of the job that Dr. Madden Brewster has noticed. Yeah, so Sophia is um, doing some blood processing for us. How did you get interested in this? Uh, mostly through uh, friends who've been wildland firefighters. They're some of the most fit people that I know and they're doing all of these uh, very strenuous activities throughout the season. So in my head, in theory, they're, uh, you know, they should be getting more fit throughout the season. You know, I could just see and anecdotally hear that either coughing more, you know, they're wheezing a bit as the season progresses and by the end, um, they're just not as fit as they were at the start. Is it fair for me to ask you what you think you'll find? Yeah, um, these are their baseline values. So right now I don't suspect they'll have a ton of inflammation or oxidative stress. Um, but I think as the season progresses, and there has been some studies done just um, yeah, acutely showing increased inflammation and increased oxidative stress right after a shift. I think that will also be elevated after the season. Big inhale. 
This is sort of phase one of many years of trying to improve the health and wellness of our fire crews. Mike McCulley is with the BC Wildfire Service. He says finding the perfect mask for a forest firefighter is tricky. He regularly compares notes with fire services in Australia and the U.S. over how to better outfit their crews. They're all uh, high-level athletes that work for us, and all of their safety gear has to be light, portable, and adaptable. Um, it has to be something that they can keep clean. They have to be able to maintain it. Uh, they have to know how to use it properly and, and put it on. We're going to put the tools that we know work through research into the hands of our fire crews, but we won't stop there. We'll continue to evaluate and adapt and adjust, which at some point may mean tweaking the products that we have. It's hard, right, because it's a necessary job and we're lucky to have um, these wildland firefighters. So we need those jobs, but it is uh, a bit of a catch-22 because there's a chance that their, their health is suffering um, and we don't want that either. So and this should have been done um, a long time ago. This is really hard and requires a really uh, orchestrated effort to conduct. Uh, we dabble in all kinds of different research, whether it's fire science or using artificial intelligence to predict fire growth. Um, looking at new equipment and technology, but by far our highest priority is the research that we're doing related to the health and wellness of our crews. BC wildfire fighters are like billy goats. They're expected to climb up mountains, haul hoses, and work in smoldering forests. Offering respirators to crews is a big step, but won't be mandatory. Firefighters can choose when to wear them something they might not do all the time, given how extreme the conditions can be. Let's talk about that mask. You took it off yeah. to talk to me. Yeah. Why, what did it feel like? I found the mask pretty constrictive. I think I would definitely struggle with it doing the work that we do. I see the benefit of it, but I think practically I would find it hard to work with. Do you think about the dangers of the job when you do? I absolutely do, yeah. Especially last year with the number of fatalities and accidents we had. It's definitely something that's on my mind every time I'm working the fire line. And the fatigue definitely catches up with everyone. It's something that you notice. Um, I think the fatigue just comes from the number of days we work over a season, which every year is increasing. It also comes from the conditions we work in. We work in steep terrain and we're breathing in smoke every day that we work on a fire. So the fire crews are preparing right now for the summer. And by the end of the season, everyone will know if these masks and respirators are a good fit in their kit. Shelley Joyce, CBC News, Pemberton. The B.C. government has now introduced legislation it says will help remove systemic racism from provincial institutions. We often think that someone is engaged or afraid to engage with government because of their skin color, because of the trust that's been breached over so many years. Whether that means reporting a crime to the police, whether that means going to an emergency room or speaking up in a classroom. The legislation requires agencies to evaluate day-to-day -day operations in hospitals, schools, courts, and other public spaces. They're tasked with rooting out policies and practices that harm Indigenous and racialized people. The plan will be based on the feedback from over 7,000 people who took part in consultation. BC's Human Rights Commissioner says the law has the potential to address the injustices and in systems that have worked for the privileged few. Some Victoria schools may be reopening their hallways to police officers. Three municipalities are asking School District 61 to bring back a modified school liaison officer program. It was scrapped last May by the Greater Victoria School District. As Chad Pawson explains, politicians say they want police in schools to address what they describe as a rise in crime and gang activity. Do police officers in schools keep all students safe? That's been an ongoing debate in cities like Vancouver and Victoria. Officers were eliminated from schools here in 2021 over the potential harm they could cause racialized students. But they were brought back last fall with program changes in Victoria, Esquimalt, Oak Bay and parts of Saanich. The school year began without officers in place, but local politicians there now want them back. There is more going on, I think, in the schools than people realize. And in the last couple of years, the police have reported they've seen more gangs coming in from the mainland, and they've seen what they consider to be recruitment of uh, high school students into gangs. And that becomes quite fearful. 
Councils in Victoria, Oak Bay and Saanich have all passed motions to send letters to the Greater Victoria School District asking that officers be returned to schools. They're hearing from local parents and from local police chiefs about problems that are flourishing, which officers in schools could help solve. It's proving that I think what's happening now is that it's proving that there are issues now because those police liaison officers are not there. Not so fast, though, says BC's Human Rights Commissioner. Nearly three years ago, she asked for specific research into police officers in schools, weighing any pros against potential harms. But she says that still has not happened. It is beyond time to do this research. Um, we're having these huge public policy debates based on a lack of evidence. Let's do the work, find out if these programs are causing the harm that we think they might be and then make decisions on that basis. Now, city councils have no jurisdiction over school boards, so it's hard to know how much weight their letters will carry. For its part, the Greater Victoria School District is not commenting on the letters. Now, in Vancouver, the school board says anecdotally, the return of officers to schools has gone well, but a formal review is planned for this fall. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Vancouver. The B.C. government has introduced an online tool to make it easier to find a family doctor. Through the Health Connect registry, physicians can see people looking for a physician, and patients can see doctors in their area who have openings. So we are talking about spaces for patients in the hundreds of thousands because of the work that we've done, the hard work that we've done. Before, the process was done manually. The government has also hired a team of, quote, attachment coordinators to help people connect with primary care providers. A B.C. Supreme Court judge has ruled against a man convicted of murdering a teenage girl in Burnaby. Ibrahim Ali had applied to get a stay of proceedings for what his lawyer argued were unreasonable delays in the justice system. As Karen Larson reports, Ali was found guilty of first-degree murder last year. Ibrahim Ali, the man convicted of killing a 13-year-old Burnaby girl six years ago, will not go free. This after a ruling against an application brought by Ali's defense team, asserting that the case should be thrown out of court in its entirety because Ali's rights to a timely court process had been violated. But after six days of arguments into the applications, at times quite heated, Justice Lance Bernard gave his ruling from the bench, dismissing the application. Application. The body of the girl, who cannot be named, was found in Burnaby Central Park in 2017. Ali was arrested in 2018 and has been in custody ever since. A jury found him guilty of first-degree murder last December. This case now moves to the sentencing phase at a date that has not yet been determined. Ali is facing a life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. Karen Larson, CBC News, Vancouver. A first-of-its-kind center for survivors of sexual violence is soon opening in Vancouver. They say the demand for their services is higher than ever. Our Michelle Gassoub got a tour of the space designed to be trauma-informed and support people as they testify in court. This is the space that I've always been really excited about and also Trina got really, really excited about. At a secret location in downtown Vancouver, a new center for survivors of sexual assault is taking form. For the most exciting part, well, one of the most exciting parts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we previously have only had two counseling rooms, um, and so we're really excited to have an entire counseling hub. This space has been designed by Salal to be trauma-informed. Everything from the bathrooms, the floor plan and lighting have been planned to welcome people who have experienced sexual violence. So we're really excited to have opportunities for folks not only to receive counseling and support here, but also to be able to report to police from here and to testify in court from here as well. Salal has had similar centres in the past, but the services offered here are unique to this space. The room just behind here will be the monitoring room for police officers so that it actually meets evidentiary standards so that all of the evidence gathered here can actually go to Crown and people won't have to go to the police station. So we're really excited to be able to offer that to survivors. It'll be a, a game changer for sure. Data from Vancouver Police shows sexual assaults rose 9.6 percent between 2022 and 2023. According to Statistics Canada, it's the only violent crime in the country not on the decline. Salal says while the demand for counselling dropped slightly during the COVID-19 pandemic, there's currently a two-year wait list to access their free counselling services. 
as we continue to destigmatize reaching out for help, centers like Salal are going to be inundated and overstretched. Um, and I think the government's providing funding and private donors are are donating. We we just we need more. Salal depends largely on donations to run its programs and hopes this space will allow it to expand. I'm going to take you into the co-working space now. Though this centre still needs a fresh coat of paint, it's set to welcome people by the summer. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. It was a massive fire that ripped through an historic Gastown hotel, leaving a gaping hole that still exists. Two years later, the people who lost loved ones and homes in the winter's hotel blaze are mourning people killed and trying to regroup. Edzio Loverin has more on their anger. It's been two years, and the mourning continues. Kind, humble, and proud. Like, she's a beautiful native elder, really. Mary Ann Garlow was a residential school survivor. She was 63. Dennis Gway, a talented musician, he was 53. Dennis was a really gifted guitar player, he really was, and a poet. Dennis and Mary died when the Winters Hotel burned to the ground. It was a single room occupancy hotel. 71 people lived there. Wendy Gaspard managed to escape. When, when I'm running down the hallway and I saw, I looked back and she, really I'd only gotten 10 steps from her door. And it was too late to go back. Justice for the winter survivors! Former residents of the SRO and housing advocates marched at a memorial in solidarity and ceremony. Emotions were high. How did it burn down? Yeah, how? Landlord Whoa. negligence! No. Deadly landlord no. negligence! Two years ago, this was my home. I miss my home. I miss my cat. My cat died in here because of the neglect of a terrorist. The Winters Hotel was run by Atira Property Management, a housing nonprofit in Vancouver's downtown east side. In response to the accusations, it says over the last two years it's established monthly inspections of many of its SROs and trained staff and residents on fire safety. This is being, becoming like a third world system. In February, a coroner's inquest heard that sprinklers in the building didn't work because they hadn't been reset after a smaller fire three days earlier. The jury made several recommendations in a bid to prevent similar fires in the future. It's unclear for now which ones will be implemented by municipal or provincial governments. This is for Mary and for Dennis. Let's not forget about Dennis. It's tobacco put down as a way to honor her friends and the homes they lost. As for the surviving Winter Hotel residents, they will continue to fight for justice. Edzi Ulevrin, CBC News, Vancouver. Darius Madavi joins us for a first look at the weather. The rain's good for the gardens, we'll give it that. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately for the gardens, not too much more rain on the way. Mm. Uh, we're going to be clearing up overnight tonight, those showers ending, you can see here. Still uh, plenty of rain shower activity happening over Metro Vancouver. The mountains getting uh, some good snow because uh, freezing levels have dropped. I'm sure many people felt the chill in the air this morning. Uh, I know I put on an extra sweater, but tomorrow, not going to need to do that so much because as temperatures coming right back up, we're going to be above seasonal through the weekend before maybe coming back down a little bit into early next week. So if we take a look at the uh, zoom out to the rest of the south coast in Vancouver Island, you can see all that rain coming in. So this is a, a pretty decent amount of uh, snow for the mountains. Just some, uh, it, it's been light flurries, but they have been consistent throughout the day. So a little bit of good news there. And again, plenty of rain happening really across the board. North Island got most of theirs uh, yesterday and overnight, but still some today. If we take a look at what's going to happen, we're going to see this next system clear out. Maybe some light showers continuing into early tomorrow morning for Vancouver before that wipes out too. Then that cloud clears out by around noon, maybe even earlier, maybe mid-morning, early morning. Uh, and then we don't see really anything else happening through the weekend. Some cloud builds in for the more northern sections of the north coast uh, or the south coast, but really not too much to speak of. And if we take a look at our uh, overnight forecast, we have those showers coming in, but we do clear out mid-morning. So overall, Dan, going to be a, a sunny start to the weekend. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. The man known as the Dean of Canadian Jazz, Phil Nimmons, has died. If it's performed uh, well uh, and it is good music, uh, it communicates.
That's Nimitz performing here on CBC Television in 1969. Born and raised in Kamloops, uh, sorry, born in Kamloops and raised here in Vancouver, he was a prolific composer and arranger with more than 400 songs to his credit. He played with some of the biggest names in jazz during his decades long career. Nimitz was made an officer of the Order of Canada and received the Governor General's Performing Arts Award for Lifetime Artistic Achievement. Nimitz died at home in Toronto last week, 10 months after his 100th birthday. His legacy lives on through the Nimmons Tribute Band, where his grandson, Sean, plays. Last year's wildfire season forced evacuations, wiped out homes, and took a toll on BC's ecosystem. But what is the impact on the way British Columbians think about wildfire threats? That story is next. And hello to everyone watching our commercial-free live stream. Thanks for being here. Farmers across Quebec are protesting. Yesterday, it was in a town just west of Montreal. They say they are struggling to produce food and government, su government support is not enough. Rowan Kennedy has more on the challenges they're facing. All that noise is coming from farmers who swarmed Vaudreuil d'Orion. They want the government and Quebecers to know without more financial help, they can't keep producing the food we rely on. There was a survey conducted by our union last spring that, that said that 10% of farmers uh, in, a, in a predictable future, they were thinking about uh, shutting, out, shutting down their, their, their business. The farmers say they're dealing with rising costs and want help with decreasing revenue. They say the environmental rules for pesticides applied in Quebec are not enforced on imports and that makes it impossible to compete. Nicholas Godet has been raising pigs for a decade. He makes sure they can grow up healthy to be eaten. They're very gentle and docile to deal with. But he says he's had to pick up two extra jobs just to stay afloat. It's very demanding, I think, mentally for me to be able to switch from being, say, a carpenter on a site and then coming back here and then being part-time vet. Right now, I think it's a crisis. This McGill University professor says farmers are being hit with costs associated with climate change, like more unpredictable seasons. There's a need to actually start rethinking programs to be able to better accommodate for the future over the long run. It has to do with fertilizer, the cost of the, the rates of interest, it has to do with climate, climate change. They have all the reasons to be worried. Quebec's agriculture minister says 2,500 farmers will receive emergency funds this year. The farmers say that's not nearly enough, and they plan to protest until Quebec promises more help. Rowan Kennedy, CBC News, Audrey Dorion. We are continuing our wildfire series, looking back at last year's record-breaking season in BC and looking at preparations for this summer. Vancouver-based author John Valiant has spent years investigating wildfires and the reasons today's blazes are more destructive. He's the author of Fire Weather, examining the 2016 wildfires that wiped out much of Fort McMurray, Alberta. It has won the Bailey Gifford Nonfiction Prize and is currently shortlisted for the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize. John Valiant joins us now from Osaka, Japan. 
John, first off, coming off your book writing about the destruction of Fort McMurray, what went through your mind watching last year's devastating wildfires in BC? Well, what we saw in Fort McMurray were these steadily worsening trends that were creating drier conditions, more explosive conditions for fire. And that, that uh, uh, trajectory has just continued since 2016. And 2023 was uh, just a more developed, more uh, nationwide example of the same trends that impacted Fort McMurray so grievously in 2016. So it's really uh, frightening. But at the same time, if you're a client sci uh, climate scientist or a, uh, a, an incident commander on, on wildfires, you are seeing trends that have been uh, developing for decades now. And so it's it's predictable, but it's still horrible to see it uh, in person. Do you think British Columbians and Canadians overall, given how devastating the, the damage was across the country last year, do you think we've accepted how much wildfires are changing our lives now? I think many people in British Columbia are. I, you know, I think 10 years ago, uh, most Canadians uh, didn't know someone who'd been evacuated. And now I think everybody in Canada knows someone who's been evacuated. And many people in BC have been on standby themselves or been in the terrible smoke uh, for days and even weeks on end. So it's a part of our reality now that it simply wasn't uh, 10 years ago. And at the same time, most of us have a plan for our day and it doesn't include climate change and it doesn't include wildfire. So we're, we're in this kind of dissonant uh, place on the one hand of knowing that, that there are fires out there and that they are, they're closer to us than they have been. And at the same time, we want to keep living our lives the way we used to. Because of that, and, and given that dissonance, what do you think it might take for more Canadians, British Columbians, uh, to incorporate the fact that, that they're going to have to deal with wildfires at some point? Maybe it's not right next to their home or their place of business, but is in their province or at least in their region. I think, I think uh, people are ready to grapple with it, but I think it's going to take uh, real leadership from mayors, from city councils, from fire chiefs uh, to keep this topic front and center and so that we aren't blindsided by it. And I think, um, you know, given the experience of the past couple of years, really almost the past 10 years in BC, um, we are, we're alive to the risk and I think most people would prefer to deal with it proactively, but we're going to need uh, powerful examples from our, our community leadership uh, as we address that. And you're joining us uh, from Japan. What would you say to people who are watching this on the other side of the world and, and wondering about the impact of wildfires and climate change, not only in Canada, but elsewhere? Well, I think we're feeling it globally, and it's, you know, it's, we live in a really complicated system here on planet Earth, and so certain areas are experiencing much heavier precipitation uh, than they have in the past, and other places are drying out. Um, certainly the weather in, uh, in Asia, uh, you know, it, a huge continent, and there have been some really bad uh, wildfires on the, on the Chinese mainland and in the Russian Far East, Japan, is a pretty rainy, wet place, I can tell you from personal experience. And fires don't seem to be a really pressing issue here. And yet, they've had a, a history with urban fire that few other countries have. And so as you travel around the cities in Japan, there is an awareness of fire risk that is heightened compared to uh, other nations. Mm -hmm. So it's really quite interesting. But it's not uh, climate-driven wildfire so much as just the, uh, the tendency uh, for cities to burn uh, grievously uh, across history in Japan. John Valiant, author, joining us from Osaka, Japan. We appreciate your time and your perspective. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Good to be with you. He served nine years in prison, but not for the double murder of which he was acquitted. O.J. Simpson has died. I look back at his life after this. Nandi Kutazi, owner of 100,000 Jeans, has had his store for 32 years. This summer, he'll be relying more than usual on foot traffic 
as the street is reserved for pedestrians. He's on the fence about it. They convinced me little by little that uh, maybe it's other people, the streets have tried it and maybe it'll, it'll help. So we'll try it, we'll go for it, we'll try it. If we don't try, we won't know. For the first time this summer, part of St. Hubert Street will be pedestrianized. More specifically, the length of Plaza Saint-Hubert, from Bellechasse to Jean Talon. It's one of 11 streets going car traffic free this summer. The local business development corporation hopes it will attract more shoppers to the area. This is another project that, with all the partners implicated, our goal is to succeed and make the pedestrian uh, period a very successful one for our members. The group says the decision was made following consultations with merchants, but out of all 400 of its members, only 60 voted. 33 for, 24 against, 3 abstained. The owner of this jewelry store says it's been a rough few years for the Strip, following years of construction and the pandemic. Well, we, we had a hard time. Corona didn't help us at all. And right now we're, we're not making it so good. No, the business coming soon with no parking on the plaza, I don't think it's a good idea. The street here will become pedestrianized for eight weeks in the summer. It will start from July 4th to August 25th. Gabriel Guinea, CBC News, Montreal. The federal government has unveiled its plan to make home ownership more affordable for more Canadians. The move comes ahead of next week's federal budget. And as Ashley Burke explains, it's the latest in a string of announcements by the Liberals apparently targeting younger Canadians. Another pre-budget announcement aimed at millennials and Gen Z. Many younger Canadians feel that the dream of home ownership is just that, a dream. Our government is changing that. Millennials helped catapult the Liberals into power in 2015. <laughs> now, eight years later, the party's trying to win back their support as they struggle in the polls. Common sense of the common And have been hammered for months by the Conservatives. After eight years of Trudeau, housing costs have doubled. We want home ownership to be a reality for younger Canadians. The government announcing that starting next week, first-time homebuyers can pull out up to $60,000 from their RRSP for a down payment on a home. That's $25,000 more than before. And they won't have to start repaying those contributions for five years. For those who don't have a 20% down payment, they will have more time to pay off their mortgages. Effective August 1st of this year, we are allowing 30-year amortizations on insured mortgages for first-time home buyers purchasing newly built homes. That includes new condos and townhouses. The government says it will make monthly mortgage payments more affordable. 
Developers and builders say it will also spur new construction, which has been slow because people can't afford to buy. We can get more first-time buyers into the market. That enables us to build more homes. It also frees up rental units, too. Canada needs 1.3 million new homes by 2030 to get rid of the country's housing gap. That's according to a new report today by the Parliamentary Budget Officer. It will not be a game changer for everybody, but for some it will be another piece of the incremental support they're looking for. This all comes ahead of the budget on Tuesday. The finance minister says that the deficit won't grow, so the question now is how will the government come up with the revenue to pay for its new promises? Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Conservative leader Pierre Poilievre, meanwhile, delivered a keynote speech today at a networking conference supporting Canada's conservative movement. It comes as the federal conservatives seek to widen their lead in the polls against the governing liberals. More now from Olivia Stefanovic. Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, the common sense conservative, the next Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Poilievre. <laughs> It's a title the opposition leader is hearing more often these days. Merci beaucoup. Who's ready to ax the tax? With his party soaring in the national polls, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is on a mission to solidify his lead and topple his main political rival. See, the thing is, it's not that Justin Trudeau is too liberal. It's that he's not liberal at all. In a speech before a conservative networking conference, Polyev took shot after shot at the prime minister and got personal. Pierre Elliott Trudeau famously plagiarized when he said that the government had no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Now his son wants the government to be in every room of your house and your business. National polls show Polyev's strategy is paying off. A new survey by Abacus Data shows the Tories 20 points ahead of the Liberals, their biggest lead yet. It's very exciting for Conservatives to finally have that person in place and to charge people who are under 40 and get them going and get them excited. We're on the cusp of a new energy, a new movement in this country. This despite a flurry of pre-budget announcements by the federal government, amounting to tens of billions of dollars in promises. As much as the Liberals are trying to, to, to take control of the agenda, demonstrate to people that they have a plan, um, it doesn't seem to be working to change people's minds. This pollster says Canadians are being drawn to Polyev's messaging on affordability, a focus that he says is bleeding support from all parties. They're picking up significant numbers from former Liberal voters, from former New Democrat voters, from former People's Party of Canada uh, party supporters. With the federal election more than a year away, he says there could be a risk for the Conservatives peaking too early, but only if voters are convinced a change in government would be worse than the status quo. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. O.J. Simpson, the NFL superstar, later acquitted of double murder, has died. His family says he died of cancer after at 76. Simpson was accused of killing his ex-wife and her friend, leading to a 1995 trial that captivated the world. And though he was found not guilty, as Cameron McIntosh reports, the sports icon became a pariah. They won't get him. From the beginning, he was a star. 80 yards for O.J. Simpson. A U.S. college Heisman Trophy winner. O.J. Simpson breaking through. Who became an NFL legend, a Hall of Famer. Later, a top sports broadcaster. Nobody does it better than her. Who also found success in commercials and movies. O.J. Simpson was a beloved American icon. Who lost it all live in real time. That infamous 1994 white Bronco chase, one of the most watched events in television history. Simpson fleeing police amid suspicions. He killed his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ron Goldman. He's been impeached with his own voice. The following so-called trial of the century, a cultural fascination, which split America down racial lines, arguing over the fit of a glove. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. That line took on a life of its own. 
while the trial itself changed the U.S. justice system, normalizing cameras in courts and trials portrayed on TV as dramas. We, the jury, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. Simpson was acquitted, but his name was far from cleared. He was found liable in civil court for the deaths and ordered to pay the families more than $30 million. He never did, claiming bankruptcy. Legal and financial troubles never went away as he became a pariah. In 2008, a confrontation at a Las Vegas hotel led to a conviction for armed robbery. He went to prison for nine years and was released in 2017. Hey, Twitter world, this is yours truly. The following years were marked by sketchy social media posts and opportunistic cameos. Through it all, he maintained his claims of innocence. The story of his rise and fall, now over, remains a touchstone of modern American history. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Israel says it is ready to defend itself against Iran and would respond directly to any attack. This after Tehran vowed retaliation over last week's deadly airstrike on the Iranian consulate in Syria. The U.S., meanwhile, is trying to engage other countries to deal with the escalating tensions in the region. Carolyn Malone has more from Washington. The White House, Pentagon and State Department have all responded to questions of an imminent threat from Iran to strike Israel, insisting it would support its ally if it happened. But at the same time saying it doesn't want to increase regional tension and that its top diplomat, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, is reaching out to counterparts. Secretary Blinken has been engaged in diplomacy over the past 24 hours uh, through a series of calls to foreign counterparts, including Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and Saudi Foreign Minister Faisal bin Farhan to make clear that escalation is not in anyone's interest and that countries should urge Iran not to escalate. We communicated to Iran that the U.S. had no involvement uh, in the strike, as I just mentioned, uh, that happened in Damascus, and we warned Iran not to use uh, this attack as a pretext uh, to escalate further in the region or attack U.S. facilities or pers personnel. Iran says Israel must be punished for an April 1st strike on its embassy compound in Damascus, in which 13 people were killed, including a top Iranian commander who oversaw operations in Lebanon and Syria. Hezbollah and other Iran-backed groups have attacked Israel since the Hamas attack and Israel's Gaza response. Well, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said in no uncertain terms, whoever hurts Israel will be hurt in return. The U.S. priorities are to support Israel's right to defend itself, but also protect its own troops, who risk being increasingly drawn into a regional conflict with threats all around. Caroline Malone for CBC News, Washington. A relocation plan is being finalized to save a stranded orca calf on Vancouver Island. How it's shaping up after this. Like it's it's always easy to get lost in your own head and like instead of like going outside or something I would just like be on my phone. Hi, I'm Kim, I'm 17 and this is Cross Fitness. I had no idea what I was walking into. I thought it was just gonna be like running or something like that, but <laughs> it was everything more. <laughs> so CrossFit, as you know, is quite strenuous. It's not, it's, not a, it's not an easy activity to get involved with. It's actually quite intimidating. You're targeting your whole body, and you're doing things that you don't think you're capable of doing. And when you come to a program like this, you're actually lifting maybe, you know, that 25 pounds that you didn't think you could do. My name's Laya Asi, I'm 60, and I'm doing push presses. I was not like in a bad spot, but I was just like sometimes really unhealthy, like unhappy with how I looked. And I feel like this kind of helped with that. There were a few girls that were not involved in any organized sports, organized teams. Um, they wanted to be active, um, but didn't know really where and what to do or where to go. And, and for the most part, they didn't really know how to take the risk. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm so tired. With everything that's going on in the world in terms of, you know, our mental health and our mental well-being, it was important to look at what we can do to support our young adults. 
push yourself, but not to like over exercise. It's just like a good habit to learn when you're younger. So you know like I need to stop here before like I can do something bad to yourself. The idea behind this pilot project obviously is to, you know, go through it, um, learn from it, build from it, evolve it, and then hopefully bring it to another school. And this gave me like a whole other thing to just put my focus on and like change my whole mindset and give me like a new way to, you know, like breathe. There is a new plan underway in Zabalos to save the orcaned, orphaned orca that's been trapped in a lagoon there for weeks. Rescuers are working tirelessly to reunite the calf with its pod. Tanya Fletcher now with the challenges they face. For 19 days and counting, the young orca has been swimming alone in this lagoon. The situation getting more dire by the day. And we're getting closer, but we're not there yet to actually uh, um, help in the whale or quisaheus out of the lagoon. Known as Brave Little Hunter, the calf has been stranded here for nearly three weeks ever since her mother died. Since then, several unsuccessful attempts have been made to coax the young orca through the narrow opening under this bridge. Now, the plan is to pick her up and move her. I think this is probably, you know, the most dangerous part of the whole process is actually capturing the whale and putting it back into in back into its own environment. First, these large nets will be used to corral the orca into a sling. She may have to be tranquilized. Then she'll be moved, possibly by truck, to a spot where she can be transferred, likely by boat, to a type of net pen. That's where she'll be released back into open waters and hopefully reunite with her pod. It's unprecedented. For each day that goes by, the lower the chances of having a successful outcome. Experts say there are a multitude of variables at play and each one must go according to plan. The challenges are just gigantic in terms of the size of the whale, the difficulty of locating her uh, relatives. If all goes according to plan, Still, a success story is not impossible. In 2002, B.C. and Washington State worked together to save an orphaned orca named Springer. She was ultimately rescued by Jet Catamaran, the first orca to survive capture and successfully reintegrate into her pod. Whether we're going to be mourning for this calf or celebrating her success, nobody knows yet. The story is still being written. It's unclear when this next chapter will be written, though. Experts are hopeful the operation can go ahead within the next week. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. He's back with our BC wide weather forecast, Darius Madavi, as we head into a weekend. One more day. Yes, one mm -hmm. more day. We're almost there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's diet yes. Friday. I know, yeah. yeah. And it'll be, it'll be a sunny weekend, oh. uh, but across the province, really, many places experiencing uh, some precipitation right now. So I thought we'd take a look at the interior first. Uh, just looking at the south to start, uh, some flurries at those higher elevations in the valleys, uh, nothing but some showers. It's been, from what I heard, quite a cloudy day in places like Kelowna and very overcast, but won't last too long tomorrow by sort of early afternoon, likely, in parts of the interior. In the Okanagan and the Thompson, we'll see that cloud clear out a little bit later for parts of the West Kootenays and probably sticking around into the evening 
for the East Kootenays, but then clearing out as well. So should be some sunshine uh, across the board tomorrow. Uh, for the for the East Kootenays, I should say, potentially might be the, the moon that you're seeing rather than the sun by the time that cloud clears, but it will clear. Uh, also some precipitation in the central interior. For this one, I did put on where we have radar just so that we're clear that ne uh, not necessarily, meaning that we don't have uh, precipitation in many of these places, just we don't have the coverage to see it. So plenty of precipitation really everywhere, but clearing out sort of from north to south on the coast and then in the interior as well. Uh, you can see here that Model C on the coast all clear now, and then we're going to continue to see that working its way down the island and then clearing out in the interior as well. Uh, by tomorrow, we just have these scattered showers, mostly along the east uh, eastern parts of the province, along the border, and then a bit of a return tomorrow with some more flurries and uh, one more impulse of precipitation before that clears out as well. Then a pretty sunny weekend to start with. Some cloud will move in at some point, and you might see here uh, we do have some cloud possibly returning to Vancouver on Sunday afternoon, early afternoon. Now, right now, Environment Canada is saying it will just be sunny. Now, as of now, only a few models showing that cloud, but we could see it continue to move in. So um, I would say don't count on a completely sunny day just yet, although it is looking the most likely. Uh, our cool day today is now going to be replaced by climbing temperatures pretty much right across the province through the weekend, cooling off a little bit in parts of the north, generally speaking, as we get into the weekend. But for the most part, for the southern half of the province, temperatures just climbing. Uh, now for conditions tomorrow, much more calm. We do have a little bit of precipitation, possibly in the early morning for places like Whistler, Kelowna, even here in Vancouver and in Victoria. But then we should start to clear up as well. And so if we look at our five-day forecast, we do have a relatively calm one, really. Those early morning showers tomorrow really just give way to lots of sunshine in the days ahead, some warm temperatures, especially mm -hmm. if you're further inland. But those temperatures do drop quite a bit inland early next week mm -hmm. from around 18 degrees to 9 degrees. So Ooh. be aware of that. Okay. Change. Thanks very much, Darius. Thank you. The rain did not stop some Vancouverites and others from lining up outside the Granville Street Shine pop-up shop. It's an online retailer known for cheap prices, but also for allegations of harsh working conditions and questionable environmental impacts. We hit the streets to find out how people feel about the fast fashion giant. I like the clothes, I like fashion. I think Shine is, is fine, like they have all the sort of normal um, product lines. Seeing that storefront there just kind of brought up a lot of mixed feelings about it because I didn't, don't enjoy seeing Shine have its own pop-up storefronts or the popularity around it, I don't necessarily understand. It's like seeing the Amazon stores around. For day one on a rainy day, I would expect less people, but otherwise you can tell it's kind of far back. I was walking up the line, I'm like, what is going on here? So they announced uh, yesterday and I said, ah, it's going to be full. Uh, I knew it. I heard Vancouver people like to uh, line up for things, but this is out of, out of control. Although there's a lot of controversy involving having like ethical clothing styles and everything. I like it because it's cheap, but it lasts long for the price. It's, it's a very conflicted feeling because on the one end I feel all those and I read all those articles and I can't support Sheen. Um, but at the same time, it's accessible and affordable clothing that's also can be worn by bigger sized people as well, right? That you don't find at a lot of brands. Well, it's not very ethical. So I um, heard about children working under awful conditions. So yeah, I wouldn't shop that. Um, I, I don't buy anything that it's, uh, it's da damaged the environment. I try. It's pretty well known, the conditions that Sheen puts its workers through, the conditions of factories, the places they outsource to, um, the environmental impacts of fast fashion in general. I mean, money's quite tight for a lot of people at the minute, so I guess if they want to, they want to shop, new, buy new clothes, then they'll do anything to do that, so. Instead of making room for like local businesses, we're, we're showcasing this pop-up store. Earlier today, an ethical fashion advocate spoke with On the Host Coast, Gloria Makarenko, about the hidden costs of that industry. It's cheap because someone is not getting paid. Um, and that truly is the hidden costs of the fast fashion industry. Um, it does not account for the environmental costs. Textile wastes are overflowing landfills, contaminating waters. Um, con people, communities surrounding these landfills are unable to drink water. And at what cost? In an effort to address those hidden costs, Threading Change puts on events like clothing swaps to divert textile waste. Hitting the court and going viral, we're going to catch up with an unlikely 84-year-old basketball phenom.
This should be an exciting race. We have a stacked field for Olympians from Tokyo 2020 in this final. Tessa Chapluha in lane zero, Marie Sophie Hervé in lane five, and Penny Elixak in lane seven. Not to forget Summer McIntosh, your top seed in lane four. She holds a Canadian record at 153.65. Her time this morning, 158.47. She's off to an early lead in lane four, 26 and 99, followed by Penny Alexiak in lane seven, Ella Jansen in third. Summer McIntosh already with a third fastest time in the world this year, 155.41 from December. Meilleur temps d'inscription dans cette finale, Summer McIntosh dans couloir 4, 1.58.47. Et qui détient le record canadien à 55-72 pour Summer McIntosh. Almost two second lead now ahead of Penny Alexiak. Ella Jansen holding on to that third position. Passes time so far this year 154.08 is Siobhan Ahi. 55-72 pour Summer McIntosh. Le temps de passage. Très rapide pour la nageuse de Sarasota. 125.08 now for Summer McIntosh. Has a 29.36 on that last 50. Ella Jansen has now moved on, moved up to second. Marie-Sophie Hervé se retrouve maintenant en troisième position. Keep an eye on the clock. Canadian records 153.65. McIntosh will be very close to that record here. Coming the last five meters. Summer McIntosh winning easily in a 154-21. That is the second fastest time in the world this year for Summer McIntosh. I mean, it's always good when I can set good times and kind of execute my race properly. Overall, I was really happy with that. I mean, I felt quite strong and in control throughout the race, so that's always good. And, you know, just trying to keep improving and pushing forward, heading into the end goal, of course. Yeah, tell me about it. Just what you were expecting and what you wanted to get out of the 200 free teams. Going into tonight, I was really just trying to focus on executing my splits as well as possible, along with working on my details and my dives and my turns and underwaters and things like that. All the things that I've been focusing in on in training, just trying to implement that into my races under uh, stress and fatigue. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver returns as the exclusive media partner of the DOXA Documentary Film Festival, May 2nd to 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, and industry events. For festival program and tickets, visit doxafestival.ca and never miss a special programming series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter and keep connected with us. The ancient Roman city of Pompeii has yielded another stunning find. It's a banquet room with breathtaking murals that have been preserved for nearly 2,000 years. These are frescoes, paintings created in the plaster as it dried. One depicts Apollo and Cassandra, a second Helen of Troy and the Trojan Prince Paris. There's also a mosaic floor of a million individual tiles. The Mount Vesuvius volcano rendered Pompeii a tomb in the year 7, 79 AD. A third of the city still remains under the ancient volcanic debris. Wow. Mm -hmm. There's one thing cooler than that. It's that the, there's the University of Iowa's Caitlin Clark. There's Canada's very own Aaliyah Edwards. And then there's Shirley Simpson. The 84-year-old <laughs> Kelowna grandma is aiming high the WNBA. We caught up with the would-be baller superstar to find out why she's still going strong. This is day one of my journey from 84-year-old grandma to WNBA All-Star. My husband was ill, and um, I was taking care of him, and the grandsons definitely, and the whole family, definitely wanted me alive, and I wasn't in very good shape. And so they decided to start me on a 
a trek towards the WNBA. And so I that's what I did. They got me exercising and got me fit. And it, it's just been fun. It's been a really great time being with them in this capacity. They hate to see a granny like me shine and secure the bag. What was it like when you first yes. uh, started, uh, you know, shooting hoops and playing with the well, basketball? Well, I couldn't, well, I couldn't <laughs> dribble and I couldn't shoot. And then they taught me that whole issue of memory mm-hmm. and how to keep on making your muscles be used to doing it. And so it got better and better. And the dribbling, I can remember one day Parker said, just, just at least 10. Can you give me at least 10? And so I said, okay, I will. So then 26 backwards and forwards think then my dribbling was up to par again. Obviously, social media can be a pretty savage place. Everyone knows that. But nine out of 10 comments are all really positive and supportive of her. The more I do things, the more I'm going to be able to do things. And, and it's very, very true. I, you know, you don't sit around and wait to die. You get active and it can be part of life. And, and I love every minute of life. Good advice. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch the newscast on CBC GM, our free app, as well as on YouTube, and, of course, our website, cbc.ca. We'll have your next local news at 11 o'clock, right after the National. Have a good night.